Ever been uh, gathered with a family and start telling stories and you, you hear a story and you think, I hope someone wrote that down? Right? There are certain stories that are so great they need to be written down, right? And, and there is much that is not. Uh, but what, even if it's not written down, it's still a great story and it still matters, right? It still matters to the family, still matters to us. We begin at the beginning of the church's story, the beginning of, of the church year, this, this uh, Sunday. The, we be, begin with the first Sunday of Advent. We be, put out the color purple. Pretend these lights don't pull a little bit pink. They're really purple. And uh, the, we're looking the purple of royalty. We're turning to expectation for the birth of a king, the royal color. And and while we often jump right into Mary and shepherds and wise men and all that is written at the beginning of the New Testament, I want to start with some of the stories that were not written down, at least not written down in the Bible, the stories that set the stage for Mary and the shepherds and all of that. I'm sure many of you have uh, wondered at times what happened between the Old and the New Testament. There's about a 500 year gap there. You, you wrap up the Old Testament about 500 BC and the next time you flip the page, the first page of Matthew, and uh, bam, you've gone from 500 B.C. to 1 A.D. You've gone to, to Mary. And uh, we, ca we don't have anything written down in the Bible from that period because the nature of the Jewish culture shifted. And so if you think about how the Jewish culture would have been shaped, at the beginning of the Jewish culture you had Moses giving the law. When someone gives you the law, what do you do with it? You write it down. You don't want to forget that. And then afterwards, you have the prophets in the, who are telling the history and how the law should be interpreted. And so when the prophets are telling you how, how to read the law, you write it down. And so that's the next chunk of, of, the, of the Bible, the Old Testament. We have the law, then we have the prophets. But then what comes next is this time from about 500 uh, B.C. on to the time of the New Testament, when those who had, script, had authority in the community were not the, the givers of the law. It was not the, the givers of God's word via the, pro the prophets, it was the scribes. And the scribes' authority was ironic, and it wasn't what they would scribe or write, it's what they read. They would read the prophets and then help the people understand how the prophets made sense to them in that time, They're doing much what a pastor does today. And so there was this 500-year gap of, of what happens uh, of this timeline that is not written down in the Bible because the culture just wasn't writing down what was happening in, as, as scripture. Now that doesn't mean that we go straight from the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, flip the page to Mary, Mary says yes, and off we go. It's not that uh, there was a pause there, it's not everyone stood still, there's much that changed. It set the stage for Mary. And so what happened at the end of, of what we, we think of as the Old Testament we're going to lay out this history in some very broad strokes. We have what, what we call the Persian Empire, 534 to about uh, 334, so the 6th through the 4th century, 200 years. During these, per, this Persian Empire time, uh, the Jewish people were sent back from exile. They uh, rebuild the temple. They rebuild Jerusalem. They restart the nation. And times are decent. Not spectacular, not horrible. The times are just kind of decent. At the end of the 4th century, we, we go from the Persian Empire, the, the next empire that takes over from the Persians was led by someone you may have heard from, heard about, uh, Alexander the Great, a Greek fellow. And he is in charge, or his, the Greek Empire is in charge from about the 4th to the 2nd century. So we have the, the 6th through the 4th century, the Persian Empire, Jerusalem, Israel, they're doing just fine, decent. And now we have the, the Greeks from the 4th to the 2nd century, another about 200 year block. And this is when times start to get rather challenging, rather hard. For Israel, it ends up being lumped in with Egypt for purposes of governance. And there begins to be this real pressure upon the Jewish people to speak Greek. There's this real pressure to stop being atheists. The Jews were accused of being atheists because they didn't believe in all of the gods. They only believed in one god and they denied all those other gods, so they were seen as atheists. And they were uh, really just a lot of pressure were put on them to what, what was called Hellenize. It, the Greek is the noun, but the adjective version ends up as Hellenize. If you are Greek-ish, you you're not called Greekish. you're called Hellenistic. So I'm not quite sure how Greek and Helen connect, but that, that's how the ancient languages work, evidently. So there was a lot of pressure because they were under the Greek Empire to Hellenize and become more like the Greeks. And this, this starts to show that the, the Jews who live
live somewhere else other than near Jerusalem lose their ability to speak Hebrew. Think about what that would mean. You have lost your mother tongue. You have lost the ability to read the Bible. Right? You can't read what Moses wrote because you can't read Hebrew. And so we have this Persia, right? 6th to 4th century doing well. And then uh, Greek, things start getting worse, 4th uh, to 2nd century. And then one of the Greek kings, Antiochus Epiphanes the 4th, I believe, does something really stupid. He puts up a, temp a uh, statue of Zeus in the temple. This does not go over very well. He makes it illegal to practice the Sabbath. Can't practice the Sabbath. Have to work on the Sabbath. Can't circumcise your sons. Can't eat kosher. The whole nine yards. You cannot practice Judaism. And the response to this, uh, this problem, it's, it's in 168 BC, a fellow by the name of Judah the Maccabee leads a revolt. This is a rural priest. He, he leads a, re a revolt against the Greeks and he kicks them out. And in the process we get uh, Hanukkah. We'll get to that later in the month. I'll tell you more about Hanukkah. But uh, he kicks out the, the, the Greeks and, and then he starts his own dynasty. And for some reason Judah the Maccabee, you think his last name is Maccabee, so his dynasty would be called the Maccabean. No, it's called the Hasmo and so we have the Persians, things are doing fine. The Greeks, with a lot of pressure to Hellenize, to become more like Greece, things are getting rough. And then we have Judah the Maccabee, this is good, right? They, they end up throwing their lot in with Rome. They, they do okay for a couple decades, but then they throw their lot in with Rome so they can keep the Greeks out, and things just keep on getting worse. And, and so about 64 BC, Things have been getting bad for a while now, from 500 BC to 64 BC. Uh, the Hasmonean dynasty, the descendants of Judah the Maccabee, are kicked out by Rome, and they install their own sort of client king, a line of kings with the last name of Herod. And you might know that name, right? They end up being problems down the road. And so this is the situation in which we find Mary. She's coming of age, right? Mary is a, an early, teen, what we would now call an early teen, 13, 14, 15, but that kind of disguises um, how mature she is. Because when you looked at a 14-year-old then, you know what you called him? A man or a woman, right? The high school ha won't be invented until the Industrial Revolution in America to keep kids out of the factories. College, yeah, not even close to that. This is centuries before that. So you hit 13 or 14, you're not a child anymore. Now you're a man or a woman. You get married, you start a family, you have the farm, you are you're mature. You have you are as adult as you're going to get, and so. I want you to think about what it's like sort of coming of age. When do people, if you think of like, we delay uh, maturity and going out on your own, but you think of like getting out of high school or getting out of college and going out and getting a job, that's kind of when you begin to be politically aware, right? When was the first time you really thought about politics seriously? When, when, when was that? What age do you think? Anyone have a... For voting age, right? 18, 21, somewhere in there, right? That's what Mary's at now. That sort of voting age for her day and her time. So she's becoming aware. And you think of the sort of the way that your sense of history forms the decisions you make. If you think of like a voting age, right? In America, when you come up voting age, the, the approximate understanding of American history you would have would be something like founding fathers, yippee! Civil War, that kind of sucked. Yeah. Then uh, you start to get into the World War I, trench warfare, that, that wasn't a good thing. Great Depression, World War II, getting involved in the world, win World War II, that's a good thing. 50s usually regarded as good, 60s. Uh, Vietnam, right, bad. Uh, we get through Vietnam and we seem to be doing okay now, right? There's a general thought that America is doing decently right now. And, and so there's... So American people coming of age today probably have a, a decent sense of America. It's kind of ups and downs, but you're doing okay. Think about what it'd be like if you were coming of age and voting for the first time, and there wasn't sort of an up and down, but kind of heading up. What if your understanding of your history was Moses, Yippee, Ab Abraham, chosen people of God, uh, King David, right, that's good. Split nations, exile, okay, then refounding, and then Persians, and then Greeks, and then Romans. And you just, you look at your people, and you have just, your people have just been under cultural siege for the last centuries. How would that shape you as a teen to think that your uh, people have just been whooped up on for centuries? 
Right? How would that shape how you would understand yourself and what needs to happen? Right? None of this is what's going on, this, this Persians, Greeks, all this. It's not written in scripture, but I think it would have formed uh, Mary such that she would have been firmly aware that her people needed another king like David, a prophet like Moses, a priest like Aaron. They needed someone to show up, selected by God, to lead the people and to make a difference. And so Mary knows that there needs to be some changes made. She has this yearning and some des this desire for something to change because her people need it. And then this angel shows up. And we read, <clears throat> excuse me, we read in Luke 129 that she is troubled. And you know, she is troubled by the angel showing up. If an angel showed up right now, I'm sure I'd be troubled too. But I'm not, I'm not sure that's the only thing she's troubled at. I'm wondering if she might also be troubled by this sense of, of the pressure that her people are under and her desire and her yearning for something better to be. Well, let's uh, turn from Mary for a second to go to that angel who shows up. Let's, let's, we'll look at that angel for just a minute. We're in the season of angels, right? Hark the herald angels sing. Angels we have heard on high. All the, we sing about angels all the time. And we see them in our readings. And then we see them on our cards. How many people send cards that have angels on them? And they're on all of our Christmas decorations. I don't often talk about angels, even though they show up 287 times in Scripture. Because I must confess I have a bit of an allergic reaction to how angels are often portrayed. If you look at the front of your bulletin, there's that picture of how angels are often portrayed. And they're cute and cuddly and they smile. And they're like flying puppies. You just want to pet them, right? They're, they're just kind of infantilized and, and kind of cute. What's the first thing that an angel usually says when an angel shows up in scripture? Don't be afraid. What's that imply about angels? There's something to fear, right? And when an angel shows up, your first instinct isn't, oh, that's a cute baby. Let's pet the baby. No, your first instinct is, oh my God, it's an ah! And, and they respond by ah, chill, right? The, the first century equivalent of chill. And so, I, I don't often preach about angels, but let's look at them in, in, at this moment, because they do play an important role. And they have played an important role in this history that Mary is becoming aware of. They were playing a role back when the, the chosen people were first being chosen, and Jacob has this vision of angels going up and, a la up and down a ladder between heaven and earth. And, and we see how they are, the, the angels are those who come down to bear God's name, to bear God's presence into the world. Angels how, are how God acts in the world. They are the tools used to protect, as we see in the book of Psalms. They are what Daniel calls for, uh, it, it protects. Daniel in the lion's den. Angels are the ones who interpret the prophets. The prophet Zechariah is, uh, interprets what is going to happen to the people uh, when an angel shows up and shows him. This will be true in what happens after Mary as well. The angels will show up to guide the early leaders in the church, and they will guide John with what he sees in the book of Revelation. All, right, all these interesting uh, references to angels, if you look closely, there, there are actually questions in scriptures about angels. Uh, there's an argument in Job about whether angels can sin. I don't know. They argue about it. In Acts 23, there's an argument about whether angels exist. The Sadducees and the Pharisees disagreed about this. Well, it's not a given what everything about angels, but they're there some way. An angel is a messenger, a tool used by God to shape the world. And here is this tool, this messenger showing up and tells Mary that she is blessed, that you're going to have a kid. And she splutters, being somewhat confused, and she is told that the Holy Spirit will move and that uh, you're going to have this, this child. And, and here comes this moment where this message that Mary is receiving impacts upon her sort of burgeoning political awareness, collides with this moment when she's aware of the pressure her people have been under, and her sense of, of something has to change, that there is a need for a king like David, someone to take up his throne again. And the question becomes, is she willing to be part of what this angel offers? And, and I wonder often, we read scripture, like we read this, this part of scripture where the angel says, and you shall have this child, and we immediately go from verse 37, the angel says, you're going to have a kid, to verse 38 where Mary says, okay. Right? We often just go right there and there's that little white space between the verses, but I have to wonder, how long does that white space last? Like, how long in time do you think it was before Mary said yes? Right? Do you think she just immediately said, yeah, I'm going to have a kid. Yes, here we go. 
Right? Think about how you make decisions. Think about like a big decision you made in your life. You drove up to your first house, you're going to buy that first house. You drove up in the driveway, you looked at it and said, that was some great shutters. I'm going to buy it. There it is. Let's do it. Right? Or you go in the park, you're going to go buy a car. You drive through the lot, you see, you go, that's a good looking set of wheels. I'll take it. Right? That, those are like comparatively small decisions. And this is a decision about having a child. How long do you think that it took for her to make that decision? Right? Does, does there need to be like a verse 37.5 that said, and Mary took a minute and kind of chewed on it. I mean, that's kind of what I see when I'm reading through the Bible. I get to that verse and I think, yep, I'd be chewing on that too. Because there are a few other incidents with angels and children that I haven't told you about that. There are two of them. This is the first time an angel is showing up to Mary in the New Testament. The first time an angel shows up in the Old Testament, we read a few minutes ago. It's when an angel shows up to Hagar, this woman Hagar, and she is going to have a child. And she is told by this angel, you need to go back and make up with Sarah, the woman who is your master and that you are, you are mocking. You need to go back and get, get right with her and then have this kid. And this kid's name is going to be Ishmael. And this kid's going to be the father of many nations, but he's going to be in fights all of his life. He's going to be in a lot of trouble, and he's going to have a lot of problems. Right? But, you know, go, go for it. Go back. Right? That's what she is told. Hagar, the first person in Scripture, is told that you're going to have a, a child by an angel. The second person who gets told they're going to have a child by an angel is a woman by the name of Manoah. Right? Her kid's name is Samson. Can you imagine being Samson's mom? Remember the story of Samson? It's in Judges 13. Go home and read that later today if you want some nice light reading. And just imagine what it would be like to be the mother of Samson. Right? He... Whew, fun. Right? And so Mary knows these things. Mary is told, you're going to be a mo the mother of a child that God is giving you. And she knows the last two women have been told this. Got Ishmael, who ended up in fights all of his life, and Samson. So... Here she is. She's got to make this decision. She has this opportunity for, to do what is going to be good and right. She has this yearning, this politically driven desire to do something good for her person, that, that drive we see in young people who really want to make a difference and that the world needs to be a better place. And we, Mary has that and it drives her. But she's aware of what happened to the last two women who had kids that God told them via angels. Right? It's hard to carry such a yearning for something to be right and good and different and to recognize what a challenge it could be to say yes to it. Mary does say yes, and I don't have a clue how long it takes her. It could have been a few minutes. It could. She could have sat there for quite a few hours. I don't know. But she sat down, she chewed on it for a bit, and finally she does say yes. We're going to be looking at this this sense of yearning for the coming weeks to, over these coming weeks and I think it's important to start with Mary who gives us a sense that the yearning uh, you don't just say yes immediately right that when we have yearnings we have desires we have this sense that things need to be different that there's a oh, something that is right and good and true and we want to work towards that God-given desires God-given dreams and that there are going to be moments during the year during this coming church year during our lives when we will be invited to to stand up and to try something to take a risk because of our faith looking at Mary I think she reminds us in this moment that it's okay to take a moment and chew on it Right? Don't be a fool and just rush in, but take a moment and acknowledge that uh, when we say yes to God, it might not change our lives as much as it did for Mary having a kid, but it will change our lives. And I pray that after taking a moment to consider what we are being asked when the Spirit moves, when a friend calls, when we get a letter, when we hear a sermon, when a, a song moves us, when something gets to us and we think, is this you, God, asking me to do something, sit on it. And then I pray that you would be able to say yes. Amen. There are a lot of Christmas hymns to sing during this uh, season, and so we're singing extra hymns during worship. And so uh, please stand and join me as we sing our next hymn, Angels We Have Heard on High.